I'd like to welcome everyone to the inaugural Norman E. Alexander Lecture in Jewish Studies. This is sponsored by the Friends of the Libraries at Columbia. My name is Jim Neal, and I am the University Librarian at Columbia. This evening, we celebrate the Norman E. Alexander Library for Jewish Studies and to honor his vision and generosity. Earlier this evening, we dedicated a plaque in the lobby of Butler Library to commemorate his support. I remember my visit with Mr. Alexander on October 9, 2006, just about five years ago at his office on Park Avenue. We talked about his student years at Columbia, his love of the university, and, his, and the role that a library plays in preserving the word and the book, even if that book was increasingly not on paper, but in digital form. He understood that, but I'm not sure he liked it. The gift from Mr. Alexander, supported by his family, enabled us to establish three endowments. One for the Norman E. Alexander Librarian for Jewish Studies, now so effectively filled by Michelle Chesner. A second endowment to support acquisitions for the general collections across Columbia's 22 libraries. And a third endowment to support our rare book and manuscript holdings including the important Judaica resources and Hebrew manuscripts. The Alexander gift has actually prompted two additional gifts to the libraries to support the digitization of our Hebrew manuscripts, including a cooperative project with the National Library of Israel. The Jewish Studies collections at Columbia are extensive, numbering over 100,000 volumes, 1,000 journals, plus important film, sound recording, microform, and electronic resources. Columbia actually holds 1,500 Judaica manuscripts, one of the largest collections in the country, including 29 in Cannabola and 300 16th century imprints, a very special collection. Special collections range from the Oko Gebhardt Spinoza collection to the papers of such individuals as Herman Wouk, and, and Herbert Lehman. Columbia is the only repository in New York for the visual history archive of the Shoah Foundation and has major oral history collections on the Yiddish language. Slides showing on this monitor illustrate a small sampling of the extraordinary range of collections we have here at Columbia. The Norman E. Alexander Library of Jewish Studies sustains and expands this rich tradition. Let us proceed to the lecture. Dr. Jonathan Sarna is the Joseph H. and Bell R. Braun Professor of American Jewish History at Brandeis University. In 2004, he was named by Forward newspaper as one of the country's 50 most influential American Jews. He was chief historian for the 350th commemoration of the American Jewish community and is recognized as a leading commentator on American Jewish history, religion, and life. In 2009, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Sarna received his doctorate from Yale in 1979, and he has taught at Yale, the University of Cincinnati, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and Hebrew Union College. He is chief historian of the National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia. Professor Sarna will speak tonight on General Grant and the Jews, the election of 1868 and the origin of Jewish politics in the United States. You'll find on your seat a copy of the pamphlet which is at the core of his discussion with us tonight. There will be an opportunity after his talk for some questions and then a reception at the back of the room. Dr. Sarna. Thank you very much. It is a great pleasure and privilege uh, uh, to be here. It's not in my official biography, but my mother is a, was a very proud uh, alumna of uh, this university. My father taught here for a few years, so I feel very close uh, to, to Columbia. 
And I think that Norman Alexander's wonderful bequest really reflects, as you've heard, his deep appreciation uh, for the written word. Uh, he was, among many other things, and I see uh, our friend Gary Rosenblatt here, a founder and board member of the Jewish Week here in New York, and he really understood uh, the importance of books and journals and manuscripts as vehicles for education, for public awareness, and of course uh, for scholarship. Uh, Columbia's uh, Judaica holdings have long been renowned. Um, I know that personally. I spent a summer here in the early 1980s gathering material on the history of Jewish Christian relations in the United States, and I feel certain and that under the leadership of Professor Jeremy Dauber and Michael Ryan, the director of Rare Books, and Michelle Chesner, the new Norman Alexander librarian, uh, I know that this library will become even more influential uh, in the Jewish studies world. Now, uh, my subject this evening begins with this small 16-page pamphlet that you have on your chair published by the National News Company in New York in June of 1868. It was entitled, with no effort at subtlety, General Grant and the Jews. And, by the way, it sold for 10 cents. If you know of any copies, even if they're a little more than 10 cents, speak to Michelle Chesnut. Uh, and my guess is, since this was a political pamphlet, that a great many copies were distributed for free, but of course it was in the nature of these kinds of pamphlets uh, to uh, disappear, and there were only a small number of copies uh, that survive today. The one uh, you have uh, is in the Library of Congress. Now, the author of this pamphlet is listed as one P.H. Von Bort. I spent a great deal of time trying to determine if I could figure out who this gentleman was. He is otherwise unknown. Uh, the pamphlet is written in the form of an open letter to General Grant, and if you go to the very end of it, you will see, interestingly, that it is signed not uh, Mr. Van Bort, but rather, yours obediently, a Jew. Um, now, we actually know the names of a great many of the Jews who lived in New York in 1868, and there is no Van Von Bort among them. So it seems safe to assume, and actually all librarians have assumed, uh, and it was assumed at the time, uh, that it is a pseudonym. Uh, the pamphlet was clearly authored by one of General Grant's Democratic Party opponents. Now, the timing of this pamphlet in June of 1868 is no accident. For months, pundits had declared that Grant, who was a national hero, he general-in-chief, of the armies of the United States. That, by the way, is a designation higher than that held by George Washington in the American Revolution. Uh, and, and, and they had known that he was the Republican front runner in the 1868 election. Indeed, war veterans meeting in Chicago in 1868 all but demanded that he be selected um, uh, as the candidate. Uh, Jesse Grant, Ulysses S. Grant's father, also spoke out on his son's behalf. Uh, Grant himself was characteristically silent. Uh, that was Ulysses the Silent, they sometimes called him. Uh, but he certainly knew what was going on, um, uh, according to his wife, uh, who left us a very interesting um, a memoir only published in 1975. Uh, he told her, the convention is about to assemble, and I hear that they will nominate me. Uh, and indeed, that is what happened. 
Um, uh, he was nominated on May the 21st unanimously and on the first ballot. And Schuyler Colfax, who was uh, the Speaker of the House at that time, became his running mate. Now, Grant's nomination posed an unprecedented problem for America's Jews. Six years earlier, back on December the 17th, 1862, next year is going to be the 150th anniversary, on December the 17th, 1862, prior to Vicksburg and his other wartime successes, Grant, in a fit of anger over smuggling, and influenced perhaps by his own father's rather shady deal with Jewish clothing manufacturers, Herman Henry and Simon Mack, they all had a conspiracy together to move southern cotton uh, uh, northward, um, uh, getting permits from uh, Jesse Grant's son, who had this high position in the military, uh, Grant had issued an infamous order known as General Orders Number 11, whose main paragraph read as follows. This is 1862. Quote, the Jews as a class violating every regulation of trade established by the Treasury Department and also department orders are hereby expelled from the department within 24 hours from the receipt of this order. Uh, the department was the whole area under Grant's command. As a result of this order, which is the most anti-Semitic official order in all of American history, a small number of Jews were expelled from the territories in Mississippi, Kentucky, and Tennessee that were under Grant's command at that time. And more Jews certainly would have been expelled had not Abraham Lincoln overturned the order less than three weeks after it was issued. Now, given the Emancipation Proclamation and then Grant's string of victories, Furor over the order <clears throat> rapidly subsided in 1863, and practically nothing more was said about the order uh, for the next five years. But now that Grant was a candidate for the presidency of the United States, the order took on new significance. What did it reveal about the general's character? and qualification for office. Could Jews vote for a man, even a national hero, who once had expelled, quote, Jews as a class from his war zone? And if they didn't vote for him, would this set them apart from the multitudes who viewed Grant as the savior of the Union? Might it raise the ugly specter of dual loyalty, suggesting that Jews cared more about Jewish issues than about the welfare of the country as a whole. Now, the Democratic Party had been gaining power in local and state elections during the last year of Andrew Johnson's presidency. Even Grant's hometown of Galena, Illinois, had elected a Democratic mayor. So a close national election was forecast. A Jewish community of 150, 200,000, many of them women, minors, or otherwise ineligible to vote as recent immigrants uh, might not actually seem of great political significance. Jews were less than 1%, a lot less than 1% of the population in 1868. But Americans have regularly exaggerated the size and political power of the Jewish community. That was true in 1868. It's even still true today. And in tight elections, as the nation politically uh, as the nation rediscovers periodically when elections are tight, uh, every vote counts. So, in a bid to attract Jewish voters, Democrats seized 
on General Orders Number 11. Their goal was, naturally, to cast aspersions on Grant generally and particularly to lure Jewish Republicans into the Democratic camp. And our pamphlet here, General Grant and the Jews, sought to advance that political goal. It opened uh, with the full text of General Orders Number 11, capitalizing its most lurid phrases. And it challenged Grant to, an to answer whether the document furnished a guide, quote, to your character, to the standard of your education, to your sense of justice, to your humanity, to your understanding of the foundations on which the nation has become great, to your qualifications for the presidential chair. Instead of searching out the guilty individuals, punishing them and preventing a repetition of their crime, the pamphlet charged, you have condemned the innocent with the guilty, and you have thus degraded the action of a judge into a deed of brutal and vindictive cruelty. And then there's a long defense of the Jewish people, which you can read for homework, but uh, uh, the pamphlet then proceeds really to the attack. This is the most astonishing part of this document. It reads, as a class, you have stigmatized and expelled us, as if speaking in the name of every Jew. As a class, it continued, we rise up and vote against you like one man. And the pamphlet, again, in the name of all American Jews, concluded with a bold and really almost unprecedented statement of Jewish power, truly remarkable for what it reveals about American Jewry's uh, optimi optimistic uh, self-confidence in 1868, but very discomforting to read today seeing how later anti-Semites would turn such characterizations back against Jews and, uh, and accuse them of controlling the destinies of nations. It concludes, we are numerous, we are influential, we are wealthy, we are diffused over the whole continent, we are as one family, wherever our influence reaches every Jew, no matter of what political party, every Jew with the votes he can command will endeavor to defeat and with God's blessing will defeat you. And with that, our pamphlet concludes. Uh, you don't have to believe everything you read in every book in uh, the Norman Alexander Judaica collection and you need uh, believe everything in the pamphlet either, but it is an astonishing statement um, uh, to have been penned by someone who, who uh, signs himself a Jew. Now, defeat for the Republican Party uh, looked to be particularly consequential in 1868 because in the balance hung the fate of four million freedmen, that is, underprivileged former slaves who had benefited politically, socially, and economically from the Reconstruction era policies that Republicans championed. The opposition Democrats, firmly aligned with the white race, promised sharp policy changes, quote, to rescue the country from the anarchy of radicalism. The Negro won prominent Democratic Party banner read, may become a Republican, a slave, or a tyrant, but never a Democrat. <laughs> now, against this background, liberal-minded Jews who actually disagreed with the author of General Grant and the Jews and supported the Republican Party, notwithstanding what he wrote, uh, 
there were a lot of Jews who disagreed with him, uh, these Republican Jews got busy. Louis N. Dembitz, a noted Louisville attorney and scholar who courageously opposed slavery and was an early supporter of Abraham Lincoln. Today, he's more famous as the uncle and idol of future Supreme Court Justice uh, Louis Dembitz Brandeis. I have to mention Brandeis in every lecture. It's in my contract. Um, uh, but uh, Louis uh, Dembitz um, uh, sent a letter of inquiry concerning General Orders Number 11 uh, to Grant's headquarters. And he received a long and rather courteous reply from, uh, not from Grant himself, but from Grant's spokesman, who told Dembitz what he and other Jewish Republicans desperately wanted to hear. Allegations that the order was issued on account of the religion of the Jews cannot be seriously entertained by anyone who knows the general steadfast adherence to the principles of American liberty and religious toleration. And a rather similar reply was received by B'nai B'rith leader Simon Wolf. Satisfied with these reassurances, Dembitz and Wolf, notwithstanding uh, the threat in the pamphlet, they came out in support of Grant. In fact, uh, Wolf, um, uh, uh, tirelessly uh, campaigned on, um, uh, on Grant's uh, behalf and uh, later became such an acolyte that he named his son Adolf Grant Wolf. Um, but in any case, they proved, in case you had any doubts on the matter, that all Jews were not of one mind when it came to the election. They rarely are. The Jewish banking family led by Joseph Seligman, the Seligman Bank also very strongly supported Grant. Uh, the Seligmans and the Grants had known each other uh, for 20 years. The majority of American Jews, however, were not nearly so easily won over. Uh, observers like the New York Times, which of course was not yet owned by the Oaks family, predicted a wholesale defection of Jews to the Democratic Party. Joseph Medill, who was a Republican, he was the famous Republican editor of the Chicago Tribune, that's why they named the famous journalism school after Medill. Um, Joseph Medill believed that the Jews of Cincinnati and St. Louis St. Louis are numerous enough to defeat our ticket in both cities, and they are strong enough to hurt us in Chicago also, as they include many of our active Republicans. Unless Grant put the issue of General Orders Number 11 to rest with a strong public statement, Medill warned, we shall lose large number of Jew votes besides converting them into very active, bitter opponents. Now, Grant himself later admitted to having received hundreds of letters from Jews inquiring about his order. Refusing to budge from his principles, quote, I thought it would be better to adhere to the rule of silence as to all letters, he answered, None of them. As a result, just as Medill had feared, the Democrats bustled about making a political weapon of Grant's expulsion order in all parts of the country. Now, another book, it's, it's larger, and uh, uh, we might have given a piece of it here, but uh, it, it, it follows from this pamphlet. The Democratic Speaker's Handbook, prepared by the party. In those days, political parties would prepare speaker's handbooks uh, for um, uh, their supporters so they could run around and use the handbook as a kind of pony uh, for giving speeches. Uh, so the Democratic Speaker's Handbook, prepared by the party for its loyal supporters, trumpeted this weapon of, of Grant's anti-Jewish order. 
it devoted three double column small print pages to quote General Grant on our Hebrew fellow citizens recounting the episode to the bulk of Democrats who actually one suspects knew nothing about it. The section concluded with lines that the handbook likely expected party speakers on every stump to echo, quote, violating trade indeed. Why that order was violated everywhere. No, the Jews were persecuted because they were Jews and nothing else. I suspect Whenever you hear a historian say, I suspect, it means I haven't found the proof yet. But I suspect, but cannot prove, that the Democrats were somewhat influenced by the longtime chair of the Democratic National Committee, uh, its financier, August Belmont. Uh, Belmont was thoroughly Americanized. He was married to the daughter of Commodore Matthew Perry, uh, and he raised his children as Episcopalians but his enemies still frequently reminded him that he was a, quote, foreign-born Jew. So he understood, as well as any politician of his day, that the Jewish issue could be a potent weapon in the Democrats' campaign arsenal. I for a while wondered whether Belmont himself hadn't been behind this pamphlet that Thord Van Bort. Belmont, but I haven't found any key there uh, that allows me to say anything uh, um, uh, about that. In any case, the Democratic Party ticket highlighted the national divide. Uh, the Democratic candidate in 1868 was a good New Yorker, Horatio Seymour. Uh, the former governor of this state. He actually had opposed the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, and the vice president, uh, but he supported, the, he supported the Union of the Civil War. He opposed the Emancipation Proclamation. And the vice president was Francis P. Blair of Missouri, a border state senator. He also had supported the Civil War, but he now promised voters that if elected, he would, quote, prevent the people of our race from being driven out of the country or trodden underfoot by an inferior and semi-barbarous race. Uh, you get a sense of what was at stake in 1868 and the rhetoric uh, that was used. Um, so the 1868 election really becomes something of a national referendum on reconstruction and black suffrage. And that upped the ante for Jews who choked at the thought of um, uh, voting for Ulysses S. Grant, but strongly supported Republican policies on Reconstruction. And they faced, for the first time, but not to my mind, for the last time, a very difficult conundrum. Should they vote for a party that they considered bad for the country just to avoid voting for a man who had been bad to the Jews? And the closer the election drew, the more heated rhetoric within the Jewish community became. Simon Wolf, who, as I said, was a big grand supporter, a leader in B'nai B'rith, an important lawyer, in a widely reprinted letter, insisted Jews should always vote their principles. However ill-worded Grant's order might have been, that is no reason, he exclaimed, why American citizens should be betrayed from their allegiance to principles and turn to a party that advocated the reverse of what is right and true. By contrast, Moses Ezekiel of Richmond, um, he's a Confederate veteran, but many in this audience may know him as a sculptor. He produces a whole parade of Confederate uh, uh, um, uh, sculptures, including uh, a famous one in Arlington. 
um, uh, and, and he, uh, monuments, and, and he insisted that Jewish religious principles, as he understood them, required him to vote against Grant. Quote, the Jew who does not, with all his heart, soul, and means, oppose the election of this second pharaoh, he wrote, deserves to be publicly branded as a renegade to his faith. And he is there actually echoing uh, what uh, our author here, uh, General Grant and the Jews, also stated. Now, unprecedented anti-Grant public gatherings also were held. This never happened before 1868. Uh, they were held by Jews in Memphis and Nashville and Atlanta and St. Louis and Los Angeles. Atlanta's Jewish merchants erected a whole transparency on Whitehall Street that proclaimed the Jews will defeat Grant as they defeated Haman. The Jews will elevate Grant to office. You've got to know your Bible to understand this. The Jews will elevate Grant to office as they elevated Haman. Um, Haman was hung, uh, for those who don't remember their Purim story and the Book of Esther. Never before had America witnessed such a public display of political power uh, on the part of its Jewish citizens. And actually, from the perspective of modern Jewish history, the pamphlet and the whole discussion of Jewish power and the Jewish vote is fascinating and in many ways transformative. Uh, in the wake of their political emancipation in Europe, many Western and Central Jews had come to askew the exercise of Jewish power through group politics of any sort. Indeed, Sephardic Jews in London in 1648 went so far as to threaten excommunication to anyone who voted in an election or took sides on a political question. And even after they received their rights as a group, often in the form of special legislation such as a Jew bill, Jews were expected to exercise those rights, if at all, solely as individuals. The last thing they wanted to do was to stir up old anti-Semitic charges that Jews formed a state within a state, caring more about their fellow Jews than about their country. So as to protect their rights as, individual Jew, as individuals, Jews over several centuries uh, learned to piously insist that they no longer voted on the basis of any interest that they shared with other Jews. Now, in America, where, of course, the Constitution treats Jews as equals, and Jews uh, are not mentioned at all in the Constitution, immigrant Jews nevertheless tended to follow these same carefully nurtured uh, modern European political habits. And really, four unwritten rules of proper Jewish political behavior uh, were commonly preached. Uh, this was uh, really uh, set down for us by Professor Naomi Cohen, who famously taught a course of Ameri in American Jewish history, and practically all American Jewish historians of a certain age, not including me, studied with her at this university, and she trained them all. And one of the things she trained them were about these four rules of proper Jewish political behavior. One, Jews may not band together in separate political clubs. Two, rabbis or lay leaders have no right to advise the community on how to vote. Three, Jewish agencies must not use their influence to promote Jewish aspirants to public office. And four, Jews may not support a candidate just because he happens to be Jewish. Now, during the 1868 election, those who preached those laws in public 
violated them with impunity in private and sometimes in public as well. But actually to them and their descendants really well into the 20th century, Jewish politics, the raw exercise of Jewish power such as you see articulated in this remarkable pamphlet actually became something akin to sexual intercourse. Practiced openly, it was embarrassing and shameful, done discreetly behind closed doors, it was natural and legitimate. That, by the way, is the only sex you're going to get in this lecture, so make the most of it. Um, but that really explains why some of the most politically active Jews, including Simon Wolf, or some years later, the great Jewish lawyer Louis Marshall, vigorously insisted that there's no such thing as Jewish group politics, even though they actively engaged in group politics behind the scenes. Then, as now, many did not practice what they preached. Now, the more vexing questions raised in 1868 and no less relevant today were, I think, the questions of multiple loyalties. Those who injected General Orders uh, Number 11 into the campaign, like our author of General Grant and the Jews, plainly sought to appeal to Jewish voters on the basis of their special interest in Jewish issues. But was it legitimate for Jews to base their votes on such considerations? Or in selecting a presidential candidate, should Jews as voters cast aside all special interests and only consider the national interest? More to the point, should General Orders Number 11 single-handedly determine how Jews vote? Or ought responsible voters to weigh up the totality of issues facing the country before making up their minds. Two of America's most distinguished reform rabbis debated these very issues in the newspapers. Liebman Adler, the rabbi of Chicago's oldest synagogue, KAM, uh, it's now just one block away from President Obama's house, argued against voting on the basis of Jewish interests and in favor of what he considered broad American interests. He was very proud of being a Jew, but he explained, it is different when I take a ballot in order to exercise my right as a citizen. Then I am not a Jew but I feel and act as a citizen of the Republic. On election day, he insisted, I do not ask what pleases the Israelites. I consult the welfare of the country. So much did his responsibilities as a citizen outweigh those of being a Jew that he provocatively declared that he would vote even for the party of Haman which of course the Republican Party was in the eyes of many Jewish Democrats, if he believed that that party would do the most for the welfare of the country and the advancement of human rights. I'll read you this long quote. It is unique in the annals of even of rabbinic rhetoric. Quote, if that party in whose hands I believe the welfare of the country so far as the advancement of human rights was concerned, was the safest. Were to place a Haman at the helm of state. And if the opposite party, whose non-existence I believe would be better for humanity and my country, were to place Messiah at the head, make Moses the chief justice, and call the patriarchs to the cabinet, I should say, Prosper under Haman, my fatherland, and here you have my vote, even if all the Jew in me 
Mort. Not too many rabbis, I think, would go quite that far. In case anyone missed the biblical metaphor, Rabbi Adler declared forthrightly, if Grant is the best man for the Americans, he is the best man for us Israelites, despite General Order Number 11, a direct response uh, to our pamphlet. Rabbi Isaac Mayer Wise, the great Reformed Jewish leader, could not uh, have disagreed more. If wrong is wrong, he who defends it is wicked. Wise acidly wrote in condemning those who advocated for Grant's election, and in reply to people like Adler, who raised the specter of multiple loyalties, Wise insisted that identities in real life could not so easily be compartmentalized. It is a piece of sophistry, he declared, to suggest that one should be the one half of himself. Wise concluded that responsible voters needed to weigh up their responsibilities as Jews and as citizens at one and the same time. We bring both the Jew and the citizen to the public forum and to the synagogue before our God and our country. Defending his focus on General Orders Number 11, Wise insisted that civil and religious liberty is a sacred boon which must be protected against each and every aggression. We must speak and act according to the very dictates of conscience and conviction. Now, actually, no final decision ever resolved this debate. It arises anew like the phoenix every time some Jewish issue, most recently support for Israel, intrudes into the presidential campaign. The same intensity, many of the same arguments, only differences in detail distinguish the debates in Grant's day from those in our own. Then, as now, the tensions inherent in the term American Jew, embracing responsibilities to country and to fellow Jews, heighten the challenge of casting a presidential ballot nor are Jews, by the way, alone in facing this dilemma. Parallel tensions face members of almost every ethnic, religious, and special interest groups. Weighing up competing claims, establishing priorities among one's principles and concerns, and reaching a decision about whom to support can make voting, whether in 1868 or 2012, a, an excruciatingly difficult, if deeply self-revealing, process. Now, back in 1868, many pundits expected that after weighing and balancing all of these different factors, the majority of American Jews would vote against Ulysses S. Grant and in favor of Horatio Seymour. Uh, even though he had the name Seymour, he wasn't Jewish, but that had no play. Whether they did so in fact or not, uh, we will never know. What we do know is that Grant emerged the winner in 1868 by 309,584 votes and a healthy 134 electoral vote margin, except perhaps here in New York where Grant lost by precisely 10 thousand votes and fraud has long been suspected. The Jewish vote uh, certainly did not make much difference in the election. Ohio and Pennsylvania, two states where Jewish voters were supposed to help the Democrats, both went Republican by comfortable margins. The vote in Indiana was closer, but the Jewish vote in Indiana was too small to make a difference. Actually, as the great historian John Hope Franklin Uh, observed years ago, the more than half a million African-American votes cast, especially in the South, 
much of, uh, most of which naturally went to Grant, made much more of a difference in the totals, they may actually have swung the election in Grant's favor. Now, a fitting epilogue to the tumultuous battle for the Jewish vote appeared in newspapers across the country during the final weeks of November in 1868, that's after the election, and with the election behind him, Ulysses S. Grant, in a published letter, told Jews just what they wanted to hear from the president-elect, quote, I do not pretend to sustain the order. Jews were especially thrilled with Grant's forthright, unambiguous, and appropriately italicized concluding declaration in that letter, quote, I have no prejudice against sect or race, but want each individual to be judged by his own merit. Order number 11 does not sustain this statement, I admit, but then I do not sustain that order. It never would have been issued if it had not been telegraphed the moment it was penned and without reflection. After months of bitter internecine political battling, Jews cheerfully united in praise of Grant's, quote, noble and generous letter, and I think understandably so. By declaring that I do not sustain that order, Grant confessed misdeed and allied with values that, in the Civil War's wake, liberal Americans cherished above all others. Freedom for all, malice toward none. Prejudice toward Jews the president-elect had come to understand was as unacceptable as prejudice toward blacks. In atoning, his letter articulated a higher vision for Americans, quote, I want each individual to be judged by his own merit. As president, and then for the remainder of his life, Grant actually tried to act in accord with that declaration. This is in the Jewish calendar, the 10 days of repentance and true repentance is not only what you say, but what you do, and Grant lived up uh, to, uh, to, to that idea. He, as president, appointed more Jews to public office than all previous American presidents combined, went out of his way to promote human rights for Jews in Russia and Romania. By the end of his life, by his death in 1885, he had actually become a hero to America's Jews, and his death was deeply mourned in synagogues across the land. So the story of General Grant and the Jews turned out very differently. I telescoped it, but you can read my book uh, in a few months, and, and I go on for three chapters on, on Grant uh, as president and in his post-presidential years. Uh, but the story turned out very differently uh, than our pseudonymous 1868 pamphleteer expected. Over the last 17 years of his life, from 1868 until his death, Grant transformed himself from an enemy of the Jews to their friend, from Haman to Mordecai, from a general who expelled Jews as a class to a president who embraced Jews as individuals. In retrospect, the election of Ulysses S. Grant in 1868, the whole subject of this pamphlet, marked among many other things a political coming of age for American Jews. It engaged them as Jews in the political arena and opened up questions concerning their political responsibilities that really remain unresolved um, to our time. Should Jews vote for a party they consider bad for the country just to avoid 
voting for a man who had been bad or might be bad for the Jews. That question, inspired by General Grant and the Jews back in 1868, remains, I think, surprisingly relevant today. Thank you very much. I'm Gail Alexander Binderman, and I just wanted to thank you for delivering the inaugural lecture at the Norman E. Alexander Library for Jewish Studies at Columbia. You have not only set an example, but a standard for everyone to follow, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you for making it possible. Thank you very much. Uh, grants of Vice Presidential Candidate Skylar Colfax has uh, gone down in history as the person who got the first uh, rabbi to make a, uh, an invocation at the House of Representatives, uh, which was sort of out of keeping with his own background because he'd sort of flirted with the Nona things at an earlier point. Uh, so it's kind of a twofold question. One is, uh, was Colfax's uh, approach to the Jews in 1860, was that ever used in the campaign uh, on the side of Grant? And the other question is, leaving aside Jews as Jews, well, almost all the Jews in that type era were immigrants, and with anti-immigration sentiment was uh, just the general concept of immigration rights at all an issue at that time. Only person who knew that Skylar Colfax was responsible for that. So, and you have to come to Columbia to see uh, uh, that, uh, to be reminded. Not, I have a footnote on that matter. Um, I, uh, it's absolutely true, and we have the correspondence. It was published by Bertram Korn uh, that uh, no Jew had given a prayer before Congress. Uh, it's clear this was brought to Colfax's attention. Remember by one of his own constituents, and why not? Colfax, in response to that constituent who was a voter, uh, uh, said he thought there was no reason why not, and indeed he is responsible uh, for the fact that Rabbi Rafal, uh, who, who was uh, the, the American rabbi, and glamour rabbi, who had to speak good English, a rabbi in England, unlike so many, about speaking English in such a form, Rabbi Rafal is brought in to give that prayer, uh, and uh, indeed he does so, attired in a talit, uh, and, uh, in a virtual, and uh, there's much discussion about it when he gives that prayer. But the fascinating thing is that in 1868, dozens of articles, I think for one person who knew what you knew, uh, about Skylar Colfax. I didn't find one person who made mention vote for Skylar Colfax. He was responsible for allowing a Jew to give the prayer in Congress. Uh, so it was a non um, issue. Nor was the issue of immigration really significant in 1868. Um, it certainly bedeviled quite a few. Uh, with nativism and anti-immigration feelings in the 1850s. As a rule, it's still true today, anti-immigrant feelings, nativism rises when the economy goes down, when the economy falls. Uh, the economy was actually doing pretty well uh, uh, in, uh, in the 1860s. And in any case, I haven't run across any reference to, uh, to that issue, but uh, John, uh, thank you so much for that magnificent lecture. Uh, I wonder whether you could uh, tell us uh, the number of Jews that uh, were in the were voting Jews or number of Jews in the country in 1868, and give us some sense of where they were located. I think you did mention that they were 1% or less of the population, but can you give us some numbers and location? Yeah, um, probably we don't, because the U.S. Census doesn't uh, ask questions of religion, but we do have a very good census by the Board of Delegates of American Israel.
Israelites um, uh, in uh, about 1880, and they found a quarter of a million Jews. So most of us, and the most desperate inside of there were 150,000 Jews on the eve of the Civil War. So uh, what I said was there were about 200,000 Jews, but that doesn't mean 200,000 voters by any means. First of all, only men voted. Could you say a word about the demographics of the Jewish population in the 1860s? Uh, were they not as substantially of German origin, that is, German Jews? And doesn't that make a difference, politically speaking, when uh, not that many years later we get a huge influx of Eastern European Jews and their position towards the slavery issue, towards business, towards is quite different, possibly, than the Eastern European Jews who would arrive later. Good. So most of these Jews, and you're absolutely right, I prefer to speak of them as Central European Jews because uh, as many came from Poland as, uh, what would later be Poland as Germany, um, uh, but they largely were Central Europe, although you certainly had Jews, the older Sephardic Jews, who were the early Jews, uh, and, and Jews from Western Europe. Well, what I think is important, and I think you're hinting at this, is that nobody in the 19th century assumed that all, except for this pamphlet, that all Jews voted for one party. Indeed, uh, well into the early 20th century, uh, Jews were pretty divided, Republican and Democratic, and shipped back and forth. So, Louis Brandeis famously is a Republican in um, uh, the late 19th century and shifts to the Democrats uh, of the, in the election of 1912. Quite a number of other Jews did, uh, they get angry at and, 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 and they are uh, very uh, taken with uh, Woodrow Wilson. It's really only with the Al Smith election in, 18, in 1924, uh, followed by the FDR election, and there, you're absolutely right, it's largely Eastern European Jews, but we have a sense 
of Jews voted almost monolithically Democratic, FDR in one of those elections hit 90% uh, of the Jewish vote, which astonished 90% of Jews would be on anything. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and from that time, with a single exception of Jimmy Carter, uh, there is no Democratic uh, uh, presidential candidate who gets less than 50% of the Jewish vote. Uh, and, but in the 19th century, uh, it's quite different. Whether that had to do with the character of East European Jews, or whether it had to do with the change in American political, uh, American politics could be debated for a long time. But you're absolutely right that the period we're talking about is the Central European uh, Jewish era. Many of those Jews were Central European Jews, some of them more conservative, some of them more liberal, some of them tended to be uh, one view, Northern Jews uh, offered a different view. Good. So this is a question more relating to current events. Um, do you see the grant situation um, really analogous to the situation going on now with Jewish voters voting for certain candidates that are necessarily pro-Israel or less pro-Israel? Um, because it just seems to me that, like from my understanding at least, that the Israel issue is a bit more fundamental to Jewish identity than certain American Jewish issues. So if you could just comment on that. So you're clearly a very discerning listener. Um, I'm, a, I'm a mere historian, and I don't want to talk about uh, the current moment, at least not in this election, but uh, you wisely heard that I see certain parallels uh, between the 1868 election <laughs> Following up on that, uh, in view of the tension that does, did exist uh, between those Jews who wanted to maintain a kind of national identity, if you will, uh, in view of the tension that might have existed between the Jews who wanted to maintain some sort of national identity and those who wanted to be part of the community more assimilated, what is, can you trace somewhat the rise of the Jewish pressure group, if you will, was there a, uh, what was the feeling as, uh, well, you might say what APAC is today, uh, the development from when they would not appear, when they would? So that's a very good uh, question, or that would again take a whole separate lecture. I would say that prior to World War II, the major Jewish organizations if they were engaged politically, believed in working behind the scenes. Say, if one were to study the American Jewish Committee, the American Jewish Committee certainly was engaged politically, but it generally worked behind the scenes. Now, there are exceptions, and the great exceptions, two of them, one Jew succeeded and one they failed. One was an effort to um, uh, advocate a Russia, um, which Jews strongly supported, uh, even though President Taft and business leaders opposed it, Jews supported it in the belief that this would force Russia to treat its Jewish citizens better and would make a statement about America's human rights policy. And Jews advocated that and they took advantage of 
shrimping, and as a result, in the 1930s, very few Jews could make it to this country, and we know what happened. But the trauma of that loss, um, three few Jews, uh, during the Depression and during the forties, speaking out politically in the same way, they weren't behind the scene. You have individuals like Stephen Wise who speak out, but a lot of Jews are traumatized. Listening to the lecture tonight, I remember fondly the joy of being a student and sitting into the classroom and listening uh, week after week to wonderful lectures like Professor Sarna. You are extraordinary. Thank you. Uh, one of my uh, responsibilities, you know, everyone at Columbia has other duties as assigned. Uh, my other duty as assigned is responsibility for the Bancroft Prize. Uh, this is the award given each year to the best books in American history. Uh, and when I conclude uh, that, um, that uh, ceremony, that dinner each year, I note that the winners brought some important qualities to their work. Solid research, well-presented evidence, provocative ideas, and clarity of presentation. Uh, we received that tonight in the lecture from, from, some, from Professor Sarna. He noted his book. I will, I, will, I will say it for him. It is being published by Shock and Neck's book uh, later this year. It is called When General Grant Expelled the Jews. Uh, the importance of title in selling books, I think. But, <laughs> uh, lastly, uh, next to lastly, I want to once again thank uh, Norman Alexander and the Norman Alexander family for their extraordinary support. Uh, for Jewish studies and the libraries at Columbia. We are here tonight celebrating that great gift and the enormous benefits that will accrue to future generations of students, faculty, and researchers at the university. Thank you very much to the Alexander family. And let me say one last thing and quote Somerset Maughan. He once advised that at a reception, one should eat and drink wisely, but not too well and speak well, but not too wisely. And so I encourage you to stay for the reception. Um, as we sat here, a wonderful kosher buffet 
was moved into the back of the room. So we hope you'll stay a few minutes, have a bite to eat, something to drink, and share the experience of Professor Sarna's talk with each other. Thank you for being here.